Our next speaker is a dear friend of mine, Mr. Brett Wilkins. Brett is a board member of Ethics and Technology, and um, Brett has been involved with Ethics and Tech from early on, 2014, producing articles and content on our site. On his day job that pays him, he works for Common Dreams as a staff writer. He is a, a contributor to the Collective 20 uh, writers um, that are an activist group, as well as he is on um, the San Francisco officers. Uh, he's an officer for the San Francisco Bernie Cats and uh, a very active in social justice issues. So, Brett, please. Thank you. Um, good evening, everyone. And good evening, everyone, and welcome back to all the ethics and tech regulars out there. My name is Brett Wilkins, and as Vahid just said, um, I write for Common Dreams, www.commondreams.org, Collective 20, collective20.org, and I'm also an ethics and tech board member. And tonight I'm going to talk a little bit about post-carceral surveillance, specifically the app-based monitoring of parolees. Now, we all know that prison is synonymous with surveillance, and the history of incarceration is one of increasingly intrusive surveillance starting at the end of the 18th century when Jeremy Bentham invented the Panopticon prison design, which allowed all inmates to be observed by just one security guard without the prisoners being able to know whether or when they were being watched. This of course is a method of control. If you have no idea whether or not you're being watched and you know there's a possibility that you're always being watched, well, that's probably going to affect how you behave. Fast forward into the late 20th century and we found that ubiquitous closed circuit television camera surveillance is everywhere in prisons. These all-seeing eyes, which cover just about every corner of a given lockup, I say just about because there's always the odd Jeffrey Epstein situation, or more likely guards taking advantage of blind spots to harm prisoners, but they give correctional authorities powers that Bentham could have only dreamed of. But tonight I'm not talking about surveillance behind bars, I'm talking about surveillance of parolees, formerly incarcerated people, on the outside, once a warden or an algorithm has decided that it's their time to be released. They paid their debts to society and re-entered it, or at least tried to re-enter it, despite the seemingly insurmountable obstacles that they face in employment, in housing, and in exercising rights as fundamental as casting their votes in elections. Added to the trials and tribulations that must be endured by formerly incarcerated people is the suffocating regime of continuing state surveillance. I'm sorry, I lost my, lost my place here for a second. Sorry about this. Oh, there we go. <laughs> Sorry. Um, so the, the, these days, you know, many formerly incarcerated people say this makes them feel like they're back behind bars again. These days, they're virtual bars, and they're increasingly likely to be app-based. Ankle bracelets and GPS monitoring, what Michelle Alexander, author of The New Jim Crow, called e-carceration, have been joined in recent years by apps including Shadow Track, a chat box equipped GPS wristwatch, which not only tracks a parolee's location, but also enables video communication with parole officers and even uses voice recognition algorithms to detect whether someone has been drinking alcohol or using drugs. While correctional authorities like to portray these apps as an improvement for parolees who no longer need to have as many face-to-face -face meetings with parole officers as they did before, or no longer have to wear embarrassing ankle bracelets, based on what I just said, it's not too hard to see why digital privacy and civil liberties groups, and especially formerly incarcerated people themselves, have been sounding the alarm on their use. One Virginia parolee who served time for marijuana possession des described Shadow Track as like having someone track every move you make, quote, it was like being locked up all over again, unquote. And by the way, it's not just prisoners that are being subjected to these apps. US Immigration and Customs Enforcement, ICE, uses an app called SmartLink, so do many prisons, to monitor migrants in the country after they've been released from concentration camps, private prisons, or other lockups in which they were jailed. We're talking about adults and children here. But back to the parolees. In addition to violating parolees' human rights, there's another motivating factor here that I touched on earlier, and that's the prison industrial complex, private prisons, the private prison industry. In addition to making billions of dollars a year from operating private prisons in a nation with about 5% of the world's population, but a quarter of its prisoners, Profitable private prison corporations, including the infamous Geo Group, rake in hundreds of millions of dollars more from e-monitoring. Professor Chaz Arnett of the University of Maryland Law School says that, quote, 
once you get into these practices where you're pulling data, biometric data, and these companies are using that data to further monetize their programs and experiment, often it's people of color who are having their data extracted from them. This, value commodity, this valuable commodity is literally the body of black individuals. Meanwhile, parolees say that all of the positive selling points touted by the makers and advocates of these apps are little more than a facade that hides the truth, a truth that means because they're wearing a smartwatch equipped with a phone, failure to answer a call at any time can count as a violation, and potentially land them back behind bars again. App-based monitoring is both one form of surveillance formerly incarcerated people must endure once they've re-entered society. Too often, these people come from over-policed communities in the first place, where they are subject from everything from cutting-edge technology like Stingray phone trackers, to facial recognition-equipped cameras, to spying on their social media accounts, and, as we saw last week in the headlines, the New York Police Department's new Digidog robotic canine unit that was deployed to a home invasion in the Bronx last week. And before I bid you farewell tonight, I'd like to both present a path towards solutions and at the same time take a moment to salute the work of people in organizations like the EFF and attorney Sire Hussein, who you'll be hearing from shortly, who along with the ACLU sued the city of San Francisco where I live for violating our ban on police facial recognition technology when it surveilled Black Lives Matter activists protesting the police and white supremacist murder of black and brown people last year, George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Tony McDade, Andres Guardado, Ahmed Ahmad Arbery, and others. And shout out to my comrade, Hope Williams, who's a plaintiff in the case, and you've already heard from Nash, another plaintiff. I mention these people in groups because this is how we win the change that we wanna see. I know it is a seemingly insurmountable task to get society to care about people caught up in the machinery of mass incarceration, as proven right now by the treatment of Mumia Abu-Jamal and all the other COVID-19 positive people behind bars who are effectively given possible death sentences on top of whatever other time they're serving during this pandemic. As a society, we're not even capable of extended basic human rights like healthcare, housing, and education to even law-abiding citizens, let alone prisoners and parolees. But through activism, through advocacy, and through an understanding of the issues at hand and who wins and who loses in this system, we can begin to fight back and even defeat even the most egregious injustices. Thank you, and keep fighting the good fight, everyone. Good night. Thank you, Brett. Um, yeah, you got to keep fighting the good fight. At the end of the day, um, just voting in elected officials and thinking that they're going to work on our behalf and not holding them accountable is not going to work. So the work starts once they are in the office. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of hopes for President Joe Biden, but we have to keep him to his campaign promises.